Hello everyone, you're through to St Mark's Online. Greetings in Jesus' name. This video uploaded for Wednesday the 10th of March, AD 2021. I'm Jonathan Fraze. This is Midweek Bible Study, which is serving as Lent course, and this is the middle of five films. Let's pray. Loving Lord, we long for more of your light in our lives, so bring that please through your word, by your spirit, to our minds and our hearts today. For Jesus' sake. Amen. So welcome back to the Lent course. After the themes of faith and growth, we come to mission and a reset for ourselves for that theme as well. Looking to the task ahead. Jesus, the man going to his death, is counselling the disciples and telling them what they need to know. I find three points. One, rejection. Rejection. Jesus returns to the theme of suffering. They will put you out of the synagogue, he says. In fact, a time is coming when anyone who kills you will think he is offering a service to God. As with Jesus, so it will be with the apostles in Acts. The people they upset most are religious people. Those are the ones who feel most threatened, made most uncomfortable. The explanation is not misunderstanding in the hearers or lack of understanding uh, among those who are religious, but spiritual darkness, uh, blindness. Jesus says they will do such things because they do not know the Father or me. So tonight, as we work through uh, John 16, this is a great statement of explanation. They will do such things because they do not know the Father or me. It's not because something else is wrong. We might actually have explained it really clearly, but it's something spiritual in analysis. Stunningly, these assailants are the fellow countrymen who call on the name of the Lord. They've drawn on that name from the Old Testament but they are blind to the identity of the one in front of them as the long-promised Messiah. And so they will end up crucifying Jesus, the Son of God. There is no mis-selling in the Gospels, if I may use that term. Everything is up front. Jesus does not mislead us. I have told you this, he says in John 16, so that when the time comes, you will remember that I warned you. Ah, he said it would get this bad, he says. We battle away in the good fight of faith against sin, the world and the devil. Pressure from within, pressure from around and specifically spiritual pressure. Blessed is the man who finds in his local church a fellowship of encouragement and refreshment, comfort and support. And that's what we need to be for each other, because the first of our three points tonight is rejection. Jesus, clear on that. And then we find removal. Jesus also returns to this matter, the matter of his imminent departure. It is for your good that I'm going away, he insists. In Christianity, the advantage always lies with those who release resources. Paul himself was not held back, but sent out on mission by the church at Antioch, Acts 13. Later, that apostle quoted Jesus as saying, it is more blessed to give than to receive, that at the end of Acts 20. And Paul calls us in his own writings to excel at this grace of giving, 2 Corinthians 8, verse 7. In the case of Jesus himself going, there is a specific reason. He says, unless I go away, the counsellor will not come to you. 
So the privilege of knowing God in the land of Israel visibly will be replaced by the opportunity to know God by his word anywhere at all, even in Great Britain. And that will be invisibly. It'll be a spiritual perception. Now, when the spirit does come, he will be the lead evangelist and the greatest of preachers. In fact, so important will be the work of the spirit of Christ that without him, we achieve nothing. But with him, we convert the whole man. This is how it happens. And this is chiefly what John 16 is famous for. Jesus says that the spirit, the counsellor, will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin, because men do not believe in me, which is the greatest sin. In regard to righteousness, because I'm going to the Father where you can see me no longer. But where, I may add, the angels will celebrate the victory of Christ on the cross. And in regard to judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. And therefore, the ways of evil will be punished. In this way, Jesus says that it is the threefold work of the Spirit to persuade people of who Jesus is, what he has done, and what he wants. Did you get it? That's nothing less than the whole Christian life. No wonder that there is such an emphasis in the Gospels on developing a life of prayer, and in the letters on thanking people for their prayers. Because... We can delight in answered prayer when we start asking for the things God is delighted to give. So how do we get it? How do we work with the Spirit? Well, let's pause and think, how do we not work with the Spirit? And broadly speaking, there are two mistakes. First, we try to conduct mission by reducing the work of the Spirit to a small list of charismatic phenomena, or to reduce the work of the Spirit to the exercise of the sacraments by authorised officials. These indeed can be blessed, but this isn't the core work that John is putting out there. So, we need to be people of the Word, but actually we can keep preaching the Word and have that central, and yet at the same time soft pedal or dumb down the hard truths which Jesus clearly taught such as God's wrath at sin and idolatry, or Christ as the only way to the Father, or the reality of judgment and hell. Further, we may actually uh, try to keep these in terms of what we're saying, but in reality, we've uh, taken the standards low down for community life, forgetting that no group ever changed the world by becoming like it. Or perhaps we keep the word central, keep standards uh, high, but we, we force a, repon a response. We manipulate a reaction before the heart is truly ready. Uh, in these ways, we will be acting without the spirit. God preserve us. God keep us faithful to say it is the spirit who must do the work and we must preach the whole counsel of God. There is so much for the 11 faithful apostles to take in, so Jesus encourages them by saying that the Spirit will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. You've got so much to say, so much to write, but the Spirit will help. Even after Jesus ascends to heaven, the apostles will not be alone. But the theme of removal is dominant in John 16. And the final theme is that of reassurance. And that's just as well, because we're human, we feel our weakness and the loss. The disciples are confused. They do not understand what Jesus means by saying, in a little while you will see me no more, then after a little while you will see me. I find this exchange and repetition in John 16 endearing, uh, quite significant. It's clearly eyewitness recollection. 
So Jesus prophesies the, prophesies the swing of the emotional seesaw. I tell you the truth, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. It's like a woman in pregnancy, he says, seeing her agony turn to delight as she holds her newborn child. And then the disciples will turn to prayer and their petitions will be everything the Father is thrilled to hear. And he will give you whatever you ask in my name, says Jesus, thus making your joy complete. What a precious promise. This no dry academic exercise, but nothing but inexpressible delight in the knowledge of God and serving the Son. What a breakthrough moment. More than the teaching, more than the miracles, it is his awareness of the moment and uh, his self-mastery that is such a revelation to them. This makes us believe that you came from God, they said. Well, so they think they believe. In fact, there's so much more to learn and they've yet to endure, seeing Christ on the cross and making sense of that. So what does happen next? Darkness will rush in and overwhelm them all. That is, except Christ, who will stand tall, composed, calm, shining brightly amid the assaults of evil. But a time is coming and has come when you will be scattered each to his own home, he says. The proud disciples will be humbled, their strength emptied out, and they will be reconstructed according to the plan of God. So does this render the work of God stillborn? Not at all. Jesus sums up his upper room discourse, which has now become a mobile Bible seminar, by promising three things. This in a precious concluding verse of John 16, which is cherished by so many. First, tranquility. I have told you these things, says Christ, so that you may have peace. So amid the tests and trials, we find a new clarity of conscience, a new depth in prayer, a new closeness to Christ. By his grace, we find ourselves, as it were, sleeping soundly in the boat while the storm rages all around. A promise of tranquility. And then tragedy. In this world, you will have trouble, he says. Another clear statement. There are crosses and losses. They refine faith, build character, equip us to comfort others, but there will be heartbreak along the way. To follow Jesus is to travel on Calvary Road through crucifixion in the power of the resurrection. Tragedy. But finally, triumph. He says, take heart, I have overcome the world. So our hope will be vindicated, the master glorified. Our lives rewarded at the wedding supper of the Lamb, where we enjoy a paradise remade, which is the new heavens and the new earth, which we experience with resurrected bodies. A closing promise of tranquility or peace, tragedy or trouble and triumph, because Christ has overcome the world. He wins and therefore we win. What a chapter confirming rejection, explaining removal, but giving us the reassurance we need. And next time we hear Jesus pray, but for the moment we have now reset ourselves for faith and for growth and for mission. He has it all in hand, our task to follow him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for these words. Thank you for the eyewitness narrative. Thank you that we can be a fly on the wall on that holy evening of uh, travel after the Passover or Last Supper and on to the Garden of Gethsemane. As we hear these words so clearly stated, we realise how powerful they are and ask that you write them on our hearts. Help us to inwardly digest them. Hold them dear so that we know the true work of your spirit, so we understand the importance of setting the word clearly, and so that we know what you have promised and the sheer joy of the Christian life 
for your name's sake. Amen. I've got a hymn to read. I think I may have used it before. It's certainly a favourite. Spirit of holiness, wisdom and faithfulness, wind of the Lord blowing strongly and free, strength of our serving and joy of our worshipping, Spirit of God, bring your fullness to me. You came to interpret and teach us effectively all that the Saviour has spoken and done. To glorify Jesus is all your activity, promise and gift of the Father and Son. You came with your gifts to supply all our poverty, pouring your love, your love on the church in her need. You came with your fruit for our growth to maturity, richly refreshing the souls that you feed. Spirit of holiness, wisdom and faithfulness, Wind of the Lord blowing strongly and free, strength of our serving and joy of our worshipping, Spirit of God, bring your fullness to me. Thank you for remaining in contact with St Mark's. <laughs>